Hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Photographer's Inside, The Photographer's Mind. I'm your host Dan Jin and today I'm joined by Katie G. Nelson. Katie is a multimedia journalist, she's a photographer, a filmmaker and a writer and she recently covered the aftermath of the George Floyd murder for the New York Times. We've got a great show in store for you. We're gonna talk about the realities of being a journalist. She's worked in some extremely challenging environments and she's gonna share with us the impact that has on her mental health and day-to-day life. We're also gonna talk about the mistrust of the mainstream media from society as a whole at the moment and what journalists, photographers, filmmakers can do to help bridge the gap and and bring people together. It's a great episode guys and it's one you're going to enjoy. I would like to remind you before we do get started, if you're enjoying Inside the Photographer's Mind then please do subscribe and share, hit a like, leave a comment, let us know your thoughts and also subscribe on Google, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Right, let's get into this with Katie. Hello Katie. Hi. (laughs) How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's uh, still early morning in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And well, how do you start your morning? What's what's your? Have you got any morning rituals? No, no, none. Um, none. No. Um, yeah. So I I like lounge on my on my couch. I'm one of those people that like takes a really long time to get up in the morning. Like I'm confused. I'm like you know, bumping into things like nobody talked to me before 9am. Oh. Um, yeah, I like I have like a slow ramp up start to my day. And then I'm like, <laughs> one of those intense people that doesn't leave her desk for like three hours to even use the bathroom. Uh, and like one of those. So okay, okay. Ramp up. Not that we ever would, but we should never live together. Because from the moment my eyes open, I just start talking at people. I'm just I'm not no i'm sorry we're, we're not we're not i, I thought maybe but you know but this is just a deal breaker for me i'm sorry okay, okay. well we'll we'll end the podcast there thanks for listening everyone but <laughs> so you've just got back from london is that right yeah i was in london and paris um i was nominated yeah it was like wow. it's really charming i've been living in nairobi kenya for like 12 years and so to be in europe and like be around all of these like classic architecture and like organized streets and like it was really lovely lighted sidewalks like it was, i was just like in bliss wow and what were you what were you doing there you said you were nominated there was a nomination for an award is that right yeah, so I was nominated alongside my colleague Ed O for the Rory Peck Award, which is the only freelance journalism award in the world, I think. So, you know, as a as a freelancer, which I've been most of my career, you know, you don't get really mm-hmm. acknowledged. So you kind of, you know, people appreciate you internally, but you don't like win the awards or anything like that. And so um, it was just this like really wonderful moment after two years of covering some really, really tough stories in the U.S. to just like mm-hmm. go and be around my colleagues and like go to this award ceremony and and walk around London. It was really nice. Was that your first time in London? Yeah, it was my first time. Great. And I mean, okay, I'm gonna have to put you on the spot here. Um, Paris or or London? Paris 100%. Wow, that's okay. I mean, this is just getting getting worse as we go on, Katie, you know, (laughs) know. you're you're not a morning person. You've just looked into my face and said Paris over London without hesitation by the way N- didn't none. even think none. about it <laughs> none. And, and like my grievances for London are so petty that it's like not even appropriate but basically my <laughs> one thing was is that like London people don't walk on one side of the street like so mm-hmm. you know when you're in the US and we drive on the right hand side people walk yeah, yeah. on the right hand side and like and then you know so there's so there's not like an onslaught of people just like you know, walking through the sidewalks, kind of like coming at you at all directions, like there is in London. Like there's, it really drove me crazy. I like couldn't relax. And then like, what, like, why are you coming from that way? Like, what side am I supposed to walk on? That, like, that's my petty grievance. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna double down on that. That is petty. London's a great city. It's beautiful. And, you know, forget about Paris is nice, but you know, whatever. I'm, I'm clearly from England. So that's why I'm being heavily biased. So I'm sorry for you. So 12, 12, 12 years in Kenya. Yeah. 12, um, were you were you kind of just living out there, or was it like work, living, studying? Like what what was what was that about? Yeah, good question. I'm still trying to figure out what that was all about. Um, 
so I first went to Kenya when I was 20 years old. I was in college um, and I was in um, the very lucrative, uh, future lucrative degrees of journalism and African studies. <laughs> okay. um, and like, you know, I probably spent some time in East Africa. So I went over there and, you know, did kind of the like, uh, partnering with local community type thing and then kept going back. I got a master's actually in infectious disease, which I really don't use, um, but did some research there on mostly HIV and other infectious diseases. And then was like, hey, I got my MPH. I am done with healthcare. I'm going back to journalism, which I kind of dabbled in in college. Um, and so for the last, you know, from probably 2015 to 2020, I was in Nairobi, you know, central and then i was working as a freelance journalist excellent i mean that's uh that's quite a journey actually and i'm sure it was uh, an education in in many ways especially living in 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 a in a country like kenya i've never been but i'm i'm just going to assume it's a little bit more um underdeveloped than say where we're from yeah i think the thing that always surprises and continues to surprise me but other people is that um it's more what's shocking is the disparity between rich and poor. So you okay. get people who are living in informal settlements or slums right alongside, you know, mansions. There was like a politician that would drive a gold Hummer through the slums and campaign. And it was just this like dichotomy between people who just really, you know, were never given an opportunity to thrive versus people who had come from, you know, um, you know, families that had either been chosen by the British or had been in the hierarchy for a really long time and they still control the country. So I wow. think that's what was really shocking to me because you could go to like these skyscrapers and have sushi and like, you know, be with like New York bartenders and then like go downstairs and, you know, there'd be kids outside begging for food. So, um, okay. yeah, it's, it's kind of one of those, like, I always say people ask me what Kenya is like. I'm like, it's the most beautiful, tragic, heartbreaking, joyful, raw, like it's, every emotion that you can possibly feel every day, which is incredibly ex exhausting personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I can imagine. And so, so you're there, you're doing your medical studies and then, then you have, your you make the decision to go into to journalism. Was it, was it kind of written journalism at first? When, when did photography start to kind of be a part of your life? Good question. So, um, when I was in college, I studied investigative writing investigative reporting. And that was the love of my life. I mean, writing is still the love of my life, but it's, it's like cutting a vein every time I do it. Um, mm -hmm. And then I, I initially went to Kenya to be a writer, but first, like no freelance writers are making it these days in journalism. It's really, really hard to make an income. They're also doing like, you know, marketing copy and all that kind of stuff. Um, but the other kind of major switch for me was that when I was 25, I was diagnosed with a neurological disease. I was diagnosed with narcolepsy, um, which means that I get fragmented, uh, restorative sleep or REM sleep. So I'm exhausted during the day and it, kind of an insomniac at night. And so because my case was so severe, I was put on, um, kind of this novel treatment and mm -hmm. it really made me unable to write. I struggled with kind of combining combining words into sentences and synthesizing complex, like, you know, uh, ideas. And what would happen is that I would sit in front of my computer for like six, eight hours a day trying to write, and it would just be the same sentence kind of over and over again. And it was incredibly heartbreaking for me at 25. Um, but I wanted to stay in the business and I wanted to stay in journalism. I, I, I loved being a journalist. And so I started to teach myself photography um, and then later video. And so now I do, the majority of my work is photo and video. Excellent. I mean, that's, that's kind of, I mean, narcolepsy must have been like, like you say at 25 as well. I mean, I guess there's no right age to get it, but you know, in, in the, I guess, shall I say the peak of our youth, you know, you want to be as energetic as, as possible, but in, I wonder, and you, you may not be able to answer this, but I wonder without that kind of experience if, um, or the diagnosis, if you would have eventually gravitated towards photography and videography, was, was there any kind of like interest in the, in the, the, the process of making images and video when you were a child or, or was this like just then? Yeah, absolutely. So I wanted to be a painter when I was a teenager. Um, mm. and I was always like really interested in the visual arts was really artistic and creative, but I think 
there um I didn't take up a lot of photo when I was growing up I did more video so I like learned on dv tapes if like you're that age or you know um (laughs) how to like you know cut actual like video film um but I didn't learn a lot of photo um and so you know, and, and digital cameras weren't really a thing. And I never worked in like a dark room and I've never got, I've never even taken a class in photography. So, um, okay. so that was like somewhat new to me, but like the visual arts kind of thing was, was big for me. And I should say that like narcolepsy is actually a progressive disease. So I probably started showing symptoms around like eight to 10 years old, but it peaked really when I was 18 and it took that many years after to be actually diagnosed with the disease. So like for a long time, I was suffering trying to write and write and write. Um, but somehow photography like engages a different part of my brain where it's just not so labor intensive. It, it, it's like more cathartic for me. Interesting. Because I, I, was, I was going to ask that because, you know, um, obviously you have, you say you have fragmented REM sleep and correct me if I'm wrong in this, but isn't, isn't our REM sleep the most important bit? Isn't that when we re-energize and, and arrested, uh, we're rested, sorry. Um, and photography, journalism, videography, they're not exactly tranquil kind of jobs you know that they're, they're, they're especially and we will get into it the, the kind that you do it's very high intense high pressure and how how are you able to do it when essentially you're not getting rested sleep yeah so it's interesting REM sleep um actually affects not just like our sense of energy but also everything from like emotional stability to the way that your body regulates your body temperature so like a lot of times i'm extremely hot because i haven't slept and my body just like can't get into equilibrium um migraines that kind of thing so it's it's an incredibly actually debilitating disease it's probably i mean it's hands down the worst thing that's probably ever happened to me um but the thing that is interesting about it is that you know when you're about to fall asleep and you have a lot of like creative kind of, I don't know, magic going on in your brain. Some of us have it. We're like, we're like, oh, that dream was super vivid, but we were still kind of awake. Or um, I don't know, a lot of like geniuses have talked about that, that moment um, right before they fall asleep. And that, that is a lot of my time. Um, Still, even though I'm medicated, I have a lot of these glimpses of like extreme creativity and like feeling color, sensing like, you know, tone and, and, aesthetic and all that kind of stuff. And so I do actually think it makes me far more creative, but it's at the expense of basically wanting to die because I'm so tired. I can't like walk sometimes. Wow. Um, so it is, it is, I, I would give it away if I could, but, yeah. um, but, but, you know, it does spark a weird sense of creativity sometimes. That's excellent in the terms of that you're able to find that positive, you know, I, I again, I can only imagine how, how difficult it must be. And, you know, it's, um, it's, it is interesting as well, because I, I think, you know, people don't realize some of the things that photographers, journalists have to overcome in their personal lives to go out and tell kind of stories that, that are on the, the cusp of society. And that's, that's kind of driving society. So you, you were doing investigative, investigative journal, journalism there. That's a bit of a tongue twister for me. Um, with your photography, when, once you started kind of going beyond self-teaching and, and, and being like, oh, I'm, I'm good at this, uh, which you are, you know, I've, I've seen your images and that, that it's excellent photography. W- was it always kind of like, I want to go into the most intense scenarios and tell those stories? Or was it kind of like, I want to take pictures of dogs and, you know, things like that. What, what, what was kind of the motivation professionally once you picked up the craft? I mean, photos of dogs were my personal goal in life, but, um, <laughs> you know, but professionally, um, I mean, you know, there were a couple of things at play. I've always been um, quite intense and really interested in social justice and using writing and art and advocacy to bring justice to people. Um, and so, yeah, I, I went after really intense things. I think you know, speaking back about my narcolepsy, it has made me a far more empathetic person to people suffering, particularly people who are in um, bad health or have chronic illnesses or, you know, have mental health issues. And so for me, getting as close as I could to that those tragedies and trying to capture those fragments of who people are when they're suffering was really important for me. And I oftentimes say that it is a privilege to be with people on the worst day of their lives because somebody was with me 
And um, I think we all deserve to have somebody with us when we're suffering. And so my job as a photographer is on one hand to bring to life people's stories so that so that there's change, but also to just hold space for people who have oftentimes never had anybody care about them or their story. You know, in terms, because because I think photography is is so important in in our society, but beyond the pictures of dogs, and it's you know, it 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 it's a, a visual record. It keeps people accountable, and like you say, it gives people a voice. Just on the topic of of driving change, and this is something I've kind of thought a lot about recently, and and I'm it's something I'm struggling with. So I, I'm interested on your take, in your take. Sorry. Do you, because we see a lot of things, we, we look we look back at images, say from the 60s and, and earlier, and, and it seems we see to be seeing a lot of the same struggles, you know, wars, police issues, you know, government issues. And do, do you think, do you genuinely believe we can drive change with photography? Or do you think it's just always got to be there as a sense of a record rather than a, a difference? You know, I, I also kind of, wrestle with that like are am I just going to continue photographing the same tragedy over and over again but I I look back specifically at George Floyd and and his murder and I think as awful and horrific as that was there has been change from that and honestly if Darnella Frazier hadn't been there to take that video of George Floyd under Derek Chauvin's knee none of this would have happened. I mean, we wouldn't have even known. It would have just been a, another black man killed by a white cop. And so I just, I, I look at that and I say, no, there's meaning in photography and documenting, even if it's with a cell phone, uh, because look at our world now. It might not be any better tangibly right now, but um, but it's but more people are starting to believe the struggle of the black community and the struggle of people of color around the world and and yeah so i absolutely think it can drive change and you you um you documented kind of the events after um uh george floyd's murder and what what was that like where, where were you how you was it representing the new york times is that right you're working on behalf of the new right. york times and was that was that photography as well or was it just was it a uh, uh, written reporting or was it a combination of all of them yeah, so I have been a freelance producer for the New York Times for about a year and a half now. Um, and I've also been like a second camera on several assignments for them um, with our cinematographer. Um, so it's kind of funny how this all happened. Um, maybe like a divine intervention, I'm not sure. But um, I was in Kenya in March 2020, right before the pandemic kind of hit. And there were all these calls about they were going to close the borders and nobody was going to be able to get out. And because I have a chronic illness, I need my medications from the United States. And I also just didn't want to be stuck in East Africa with a looming pandemic. So I left my apartment with two suitcases, was like, I'll be back in a little bit and went back to my parents' house at, I was 33 at the time, um, to move into my parents' house in South Minneapolis. And I was, I was like, this is the end of my career. Like I am going to leave journalism. I'm leaving photography. Maybe I'll take dog photos for the rest of my life. Like, because it just like, wasn't working anymore, you know? And I was out of Kenya and I was looking at my parents in their attic. Um, and then George Floyd was murdered less than two miles from my house, um, in May. And, and I, I mean, it was just unbelievable. I mean, it was still, I, I'm still in shock about the whole thing. And, I ended up the day after he was, he was murdered, there were some like rallies and protests. So I went down there, took a couple photos, um, posted them on my Facebook. And the next day I got this call from a, a guy that I had met maybe once. He lived in Nairobi, but we never overlapped. And he had moved to Minneapolis. He was from Denver. He had just happened to move to Minneapolis. His name's Mike Shum. And he's like, hey, Katie, uh, what are you doing? And I was like, uh, I'm just looking at the protests. And it was down at the police station that later burned down. And he's like, I have this client that needs a producer and he wants a producer to, you know, be with me for the day. Can you take a call? Are you available? I said, sure. Because I was working at the time for an agency for $125 a day as a photographer, all rights to them. And I was like, yeah, get me on the line. And so I get on the line, I get this call and it's like, hi, this is Jonah Kessel with the New York Times. 
<laughs> are you available? Have you produced before? And I was like, yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> which I mean, like I had produced my own stuff, but like I never worked as a producer, but I was like, yeah, for sure. Like I can do this. Um, and he's like, cool. Like, well, we just want you for the day and then we'll see how it goes, whatever. And then that night, the third precinct police station was burned down and Mike was Mike and I were there the whole time throughout the night. And, um, you know, and we were carrying big FS sevens, like, and we were really the only people with like professional level cameras there, um, video cameras. And so from there, I worked for them for the last year and a half. So I've done all of George Floyd stuff. Um, all Dante Wright, who is another black man that was killed. Uh, Jamar Clark, who is in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Kyle Rittenhouse. We were about 20 minutes away from Kyle Rittenhouse um, killing those people. And then I also did the elections, um, the Trump elections. So, yeah. With with the the George the George Floyd um, events, what can, do you think it impacts you differently because it is so close to home? You know, yes and no. So um, for me, I was able in many ways to kind of like distance myself from from how much hurt I had watching the whole thing. I mean, suffering to me is kind of suffering. Is suffering in Africa is the same to me as suffering in Minneapolis in many ways. Um, but I think my sense of safety in terms of reporting, I thought I was going to be safe in Minneapolis doing my job, and I was not. Um, I was. I and my colleagues were directly targeted by law enforcement agencies um, and assaulted by them, and that that shook me in a way because I was like, I'm not in Kenya, I'm not in Congo, I'm not in Somalia, I'm not you know, mentally kind of there, ready to go to war. I'm like you know, a mile from my house being shot at with tear gas and rubber bullets. Like, um, so that shook me a lot. Yeah. That must, I mean, what is going on? Because I, I've written about this a lot over the past year in terms of this, this, I mean, all around the world, it's not just, just unique to the States. I've, you know, I've seen it in, in, in my country, even though I've been of England, even though I've not been there for three years, but it seems there's a, more and more journalists, whether they're reporters, photographers, videographers, that are, are, are being attacked by law enforcement. I mean, I, I interviewed a couple of photographers last year who were in Portland, and uh, a guy got hit by I think, rubber bullets as well. Uh, and it's there seems to be this big drive of intimidation to stop people reporting on what's going on. And I just wonder what your take is on that. How How do you... How do you fight back against that? Because it must be difficult now. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's been scary. Um, and again, I, I somewhat expected it in other countries or, or, or the lack of accountability, I should say, in other countries. Um, but here I just like wasn't expecting to be targeted. So I have and I recommend all photographers who are interested in conflict reporting um, to enroll in a HEFAT training, which is a hazardous environment training. Um, you can do them sometimes online or they're in person and they prepare you basically for working in conflict. So like both medic training, like if you are hit with like a rubber bullet or you're shot, like, you know, what to do in an emergency. Um, what to wear, what the best gas mask is, how to like handle, you know, spinal cord injuries, all of these kinds of things, how to navigate yourself in protests. That's like really important and risk assessment. So, but I had all of these things like, and I, I've taken three key fat trainings and like my colleagues, uh, you know, were <laughs> reporting on the Arab Spring. One of my colleagues, two of my colleagues have been kidnapped on the job and still we were assaulted by law enforcement very severely. And so, um, it's quite horrific. I will say that um, at times I have felt like I don't even want to talk about it because there have been so many journalists who have been like, well, it wasn't like you were kidnapped. It wasn't like you lost your eye. You know, people kind of to cope with this kind of trauma in this industry really minimize uh, what happens to others because they're like they can't really compute otherwise. Um, but I, shortly after I was assaulted over like a course of like three weeks by law enforcement here, I was approached by the ACLU who, uh, offered to represent me and several other journalists who were assaulted and arrested and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And now we're taking, um, Minnesota law enforcement, um, you know, in court, we're suing them for, for assault right now. Wow. That is, and I, I you, you, you raise, um, a good point is a lot of people to to deal with 
situations like that. They they try and make an individual think, oh, it could have been so much worse. But I don't I don't personally think that's the right way to to deal with it because you, you, you're essentially sending the message to the individual that they have no right to express how a certain situation has impacted them. And, you know, it, it doesn't validate them. And then you, you kind of, I, I, you know, you may be able to speak on this of me, but I don't know if you're now taking that trauma into other jobs that you do because it's always in the back of your mind. So h- how how do you do that? Because yes, you've, you've done the, you, you did the work and, you know, th- what happened happened and that's still going on how do you then put that to one side and go on to the next job you don't you don't you live with this and i think that's the misconception about trauma particularly in the journalism industry is like if you just keep pushing if you just keep going through if you just go to the next assignment like you'll forget about the last one but like that trauma lives in your body whether you want it or not and um, I, I have found, so I, I do believe that women are more expressive in the immediate about trauma. Like they'll be like, that, that wasn't okay. Like I, I'm really afraid. I'm really scared right now. And men kind of have this like, no, it's, it's totally fine. It's, it's good. You're, we're all safe. Um, but what happens is that the men who are kind of just like pushing these things to the side a year later or two years later, they're completely broken people. Um, and then they'll come back. I've had so many colleagues come back to me and say like, actually, that was really horrific what happened to us. Um, I just didn't realize. And so I think it's really important to have these conversations. Um, I have been incredibly affected by what happened in Minneapolis. Um, I was wearing earplugs 24-7 after um, the protests and then again after Dante Wright was killed um, because I couldn't even take my mom putting dishes into the cabinets from the dishwasher. The, the sound was so abrasive to me or people like shutting doors. Um, when I was in London, I really struggled to be in like public spaces where there were a lot of people because I feel like I, I still kind of like look around for every exit. And I feel like if there's a shift in the crowd, like I I like need to get out really quickly. Um and so, you know, I, and I'm in like PTSD therapy, which is incredibly helpful. If, if anybody is going through that, I highly recommend EMDR training. Um, but it, it, that stuff lives with you. It is not normal to see people suffering every day or, or however many times you see it. That is not a normal experience. And our bodies are not able to cope with that unless we get help processing those very, very traumatic experiences. I was actually going, you touched on it with, with the therapy that you're doing. Is, is, is there any other kind of like day-to-day self-care habits or, or things that you do that is helping you manage and function? Yeah, I think the thing about trauma, which is so different than, you know, I, I mean, I've lived with depression all my life, but trauma feels so different to me. And my, my therapist who helps me with this rapid eye movement therapy, which is really helpful for PTSD, she says, basically, like, people will tell you to like do some breathing exercises or like envision dolphins in the the ocean to calm down or like do some yoga. But people who have intense trauma are honestly not able to do that kind of stuff. Like their body is just expressing this trauma in a way that like you're not able to calm yourself down. And so you need to like learn these techniques like EMDR or like work with somebody professionally because like you are not going to be able to yoga your way out of this most of the time. At least like she was like, you you can't do that. Um, But there are some things that I do. (laughs) She was like, no, no. Um, But (laughs) but, uh, (laughs) she, um, she's like given me some really like tangible stuff. Like, um, like she gets me a weighted blanket, which sounds like I'm like one of those tiny, like shivering Chihuahua dolls, dogs. But like, I like lay under that because it makes me feel secure or like, um, honestly, I, I, right now I'm not able to do my job doing protests and covering like riots and stuff like that, because my brain is so fried, um, yeah. that like, it's only adding to the trauma. And so trying to protect myself, even like, I, I more enjoy like being in small spaces, like a bedroom that's smaller. Cause it just makes me feel like a little bit safer than okay. like large bass rooms. So like, I honestly try to pay attention to that kind of stuff and say like, yeah, this might not solve my PTSD, like for my lifetime, but like building in these small kind of like safety things is really helpful. And, and also just like talking to my colleagues. I mean, that's a huge thing for me too. And just being around 
other people who are photographers to commiserate about it and be like, wow, like civilians don't, don't really get this, but like you do. Yeah. Yeah. And community in, in that sense is, is so important. That's, that's something I'm learning in, in life in general at the moment that just having a community, cause I think, you know, photographers, journalists, you know, w w there are times where we spend a lot of time on our own, you know, because just the nature of the beast, um, and yeah, having, having a support network around you, like, and more importantly, a like-minded support network, uh, of where people can kind of be like, oh yeah, I totally get that is one of the most important things we can have. And I think, especially in today's, um, sense of culture where people are just so locked into the internet and things like that, we, we need to have people like you who are like, no, we need proper support groups and network in our day-to-day -day lives to help us handle everything really the good and the bad absolutely absolutely i mean one of i will like give a plug to london because my best experience there yeah was going yeah. to the, was going to the <laughs> frontline club have you been to the frontline club i haven't no oh my god so if you're a journalist if you're a photographer if you do documentary stuff please visit the frontline club in um in london it's like it's a kind of a support organization for you know documentary people but it also has um accommodation that is discounted for freelancers and it's really lovely and mm -hmm. it's like in central london and then it has a bar <laughs> um that like you know all of these journalists come in from all over the world and just like sh you know shoot the crap there and and talk about their assignments and you know just kind of like relax for a little bit around each other um and it was just so cathartic for me to be around my peers and colleagues who you know, didn't question why I like, didn't like loud bangs outside, you know? Yeah. Um, it was just nice. So Frontline Club, highly recommend. Okay. When, when I eventually ever return to, to the motherland, I, I will bear that in mind. I, I want to go back in time just a little bit. Um, can you, can you recall your, your first, uh, photography assignment? Um, let's see. Yeah, probably. Um, I think, you know, so I, I had like a Rebel X XTI. Does that sound right? Like a Canon. Yeah. I shoot Nikon and Sony now. So, yeah. but um, yeah, I was like working for a nonprofit actually, and they were like, "Hey, could you just bring this camera and take some portraits of people?" And I was like, "Yeah, sure." You know, auto only. And then um, you know, it was kind of like living that life for a little bit, just trying to figure out like what this was. And I'm one of those people that just like enjoys suffering. So I'd rather not read the manual and just like suffer for three years trying to figure it out myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> like, I'm Midwestern. So I like really like that suffering life. Okay. Um, but like, you know, eventually, like I kind of got into it. And then yeah, I, I mean, I will say that photography brought my level of like recognition and professionalism as a journalist, like up to new heights where I just don't think I, I wouldn't be in the same you know, position that I was, I, that I am now. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that was my first assignment. It was like, uh, portraits for a nonprofit and they were awful. I looked them up the other day. I like highly recommend photographers go back like five years or to the beginning of their career and look at where they are then versus now, because it's, it was so incredible to see. How do you, okay. So yeah, it, that's true. Um, I look, I look back at old work and I'm like, Oh, I thought I was a genius back then. And I, I was, I was telling everyone like, guys, you're in the presence of genius right now. Show some respect. And then I look okay. back and I'm like, oh, that's why I, all my friends stopped being my friend. Okay. I get it now. I get it. But, but how do you feel about your level of photography and videography as well in the present moment? How do you feel about it? You know, I've had such an opposite experience where I, and I don't know if it's also being a woman too, where we're, we're kind of like, oh, this, our work is so bad, you know, compared to, to other people. And like, we're very self-critical, but looking back on my photography now from when I was in Africa, I'm like, wow, this is like really quite astounding work uh, for me. And maybe it's because I have emotion that's connected to it, but I'm just like, wow, um, this took a lot of grit and determination to get these images. I think, you know, we all have different phases of our photography. It's like learning and then like mastering technicals. And then it's kind of like, just like consistency. And then it's kind of, you go to this phase where you're like, how do I encapsulate this moment, this second in history and make people feel it like they were there? Or like, how do I emote kind of that, like that sense of, 
how that person was feeling in this image. And that's kind of where I, my next challenge is. And that's kind of where I'm trying to aim myself into in, in terms of photography is like, how do I blow past kind of the run and gun, like wide angles or like kind of the classic portrait shots to really kind of feel, feel the space and feel the image and like bring that out in the final product. Yep. Um, so that's, yeah. So, I mean, I, I find like photography to always have a new challenge. I'm also shooting a lot of film and um, I just nice. had this infrared film in London um, and I brought it to Paris and I was inspired by this photographer who went to Congo with infrared film and photographed a lot of the rebel movements of soldiers. And, um, but it's all in this like pink red cast because it's an infrared yeah. film. And so it brings this like carnival esque look to conflict and war. Um, mm -hmm. And so I brought a couple rolls back and I'm going to shoot them in Minneapolis. There's a couple of like gatherings going on here um, for another trial of a black man that was killed. And so I'm going to try to kind of like play with that and see if those come out or not. Film is, I tried shooting film one day and it stayed one day because I was like, I, no, no, this is too, too difficult. For, I mean, have you, have you been in a scenario where you've had to kind of document something meaningful, shall we say, um, and shot film? Have, have you done that before? I haven't. So, um, I have my, so my drive for shooting film is more to slow down because I have been in such high intensity kind of conflict and war for the last like 10 years that I just like, I have kind of like shiny object syndrome, like on top of PTSD where I'm kind of like not even in the moment. I'm just like making sure I'm not going to get shot. And so like shooting film is making me slow down frame by frame. So I only shoot like not nice things, but things that like either make me feel like I'm slowing down or that can be more beautiful. Um, but you know, if it's like, I, I mean, I will say that if it's a professional setting or I see something like a breaking news and I just have my cell phone, I would, I will take that over a film camera if it's breaking news. And because oftentimes the New York times will take people's cell phone video. If it's like a, that much of a news, like a breaking news situation. So like, I do feel like it's for me, if it's like important, I'll even use my phone. So how do you feel about that? Because we are living in a time now and you referenced the, um, please remind me of her name, the girl that, that videoed the, um, the, the police. Oh, Darnella Frazier, yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, she, she won a, an, a journalism award for that, right? Absolutely. So how, how do you feel, a, a Pulitzer, geez, well, there you go, a Pulitzer Prize, which, which is great. How, how do you feel about that though? Because, you know, wonderful that she was brave enough to do that, especially considering the circumstances. Um, but essentially she just got our phone, which is what we all do nowadays because of the culture that we're in. So when you, when you see people who are not necessarily journalists or people getting, you know, publications in, 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 uh, renowned, um, publications online or in, in print, I guess, as well. And they just took it with a mobile phone and you're there with like these uh, cameras that's cost thousands of dollars. Do you ever think, well, I'm, how do you feel about all that? It is a strange time where it, in a way, everyone's a journalist now. Yeah. I mean, you know, for me, I, I always see people who kind of like poo poo, um, other photographers for their gear issues or like, Oh, that person shouldn't have won that award. Like I kind of just, I'm like, you jealous? Like what, what's your deal here? You know? Um, yes. and for D Darnella, like, you know, I sincerely, a a as like, I have two documenting people's mur literal murders. Um, I wish I, I wish I wouldn't have had to, like, I'm sure she would give that back anytime. Um, but what she did was a huge public service. I, you know, so, and, and like, I worked on this reenact, not a reenactment, uh, kind of like a investigation into George Floyd's murder, because when George Floyd was murdered, the police said here that it was like a medical incident and that he basically had like done it to himself. And so that was what everyone was kind of walking into. And I helped make this like investigation that is now, if you Google George Floyd, it's like the number one ranked on, on Google. Um, but like, we used a lot of like CCTV people's like cell phone video. We used like a lot of like crowd gathered video and live streams to create that. And so, I mean, there is value in that if people are brave enough to record it. Um, however, like 
in terms of like working in this industry, you you need to have nicer gear, like um, to shoot for the New York Times, like you have to have a certain level of gear um, to, to, you know, be contracted out for them. You're not going to make money, nor are you going to have a consistent, you know, professional life if, if you're not able to invest in that kind of stuff. No, I, I would agree with that. You know, it's, it's, it's okay in isolated moments and yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure people are, um, jealous of the Pulitzer, uh, that was won. I know I was, I was like, what? No, I, but, but you know, it's, I'm not disagreeing with the, with the action, but certainly but there the is, question of course is, you would have to live with that trauma then. Like that's what people don't understand about true. this. You know what I mean? And, and that's been a hard thing for me too, is like, I, you know, I was on a team that was nominated for an Emmy this year. I was, you know, in London for this other award and people have come to me and been like, oh my God, like, you must be so happy. You like, you know, this is a huge professional break for you. And I'm like, do you fall asleep at night listening to George Floyd screaming for his mother in your head? Like, mm -hmm. do you, do you, are you unable to function around men who you don't know because you are, because they feel like police? Like, are you able to, you know, go to a parade, a winter parade and enjoy yourself? Or are you literally dry heaving in a corner while somebody's trying to calm you down because you're so afraid of all the banging and stuff? Like, so, so there, like, I was at the Rory Peck Awards and I was talking to somebody and he's like, yeah, you know, you get to this age at 35 where you've suddenly made it, but you look around and you're like, this has, I've sacrificed a lot, a lot for this. Well, let, let, let's go into that a little bit deeper because, you know, you said that when you got back to Minneapolis that you felt your photography career was, or your career in journalism as a whole was, was done. And then you get the call from the New York Times, uh, at what with the, the guy who got in touch and links you up with the New York Times. And then that's the catalyst to, to spur your career forward. But what happened to do that is obviously the, the killing of George Floyd. So how... I know not much time has passed relatively, but how do you kind of be like, oh, that happened and that's that that spurred my career on, but it happened because uh, a man was killed by police. How how does that sit with you? Yeah, or how, I mean, how do you kind of process it? You So nobody tells you how to deal with this stuff. Like, again, people latch on to the success of your career and like it's it's appreciated, you know, like, it's really nice to have people kind of, you know, cheer me on. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to see if he's going to jump in. Come on, I think that is. is that can you hear me? Sorry about that. For everyone listening, we had um, uh, internet issues. The internet gods decided that they didn't want to see me anymore, and they took me offline. So I apologize to you as well, Katie. Thanks for, for sticking with. Um, so before before we were rudely interrupted, we were, we were talking about kind of, yeah, the the your career kind of taking off but at the consequence of you know the the george floyd's murder and and just we were trying i was trying to understand and help listeners understand kind of how you process that yeah um i mean it's been difficult to reconcile having a, a, a successful career at the cost of a man's murder um and i definitely you know, struggled with that alongside, you know, the loss of living. I had lived in Kenya for 12 years and the loss of kind of leaving that place to come home to my parents. And, um, you know, it, 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 it's complicated. And I think that people don't give enough credit or enough understanding to the fact that that journalism is really complicated, as well as kind of like doing conflict and war and what the cost is personally for that. Um, and I will say, and it was like, it was a strange thing for me. Um, so I left Kenya quite devastated. I had a, um, a personal loss that was, that was gutting for me. And I, you know, I went home during a pandemic to live at my parents' house. And then all of a sudden, like everything kind of came together. Um, so my journalism career that I had, you know, worked at so hard and tireless, tirelessly for so many years. I always said I would leave Kenya the moment I got one article in the New York Times, like even a like a co-byline or even like contributed reporting. I was like, I can leave the continent now. And suddenly, like I was getting front page articles every day um, with my colleagues. And, um, you know, Mike called me and was like, you know, I know that you have this HEFAT training, this conflict training, and really nobody else does in Minneapolis right now. And so it was like, 
wow, all of this training that I had done in, in Africa, thinking I would be doing conflict, like has suddenly, you know, the divine had like found me um, and put me in that situation. And so um, I, I also say that because of that, I was one of the best people to do the, the job that I was chosen to do. Like I grew up in yeah. Minneapolis. I knew that I knew that intersection. My mom worked right down there. Like I was down there a lot. I knew the people in the community. Like I, I knew how to work in war. Like I knew how to avoid certain situations and even just like driving directions. Sometimes like at night we would get caught in these protests or like law enforcement would close down areas. And I was like, I know this shortcut. So it's kind of like all of these divine um, interventions came together and was like, you might be devastated because of the loss in, in Kenya and, and the personal loss that you went through. But like, I'm, but like, it wasn't all in vain. Yeah. Something I want to get your opinion on um, is, so um, Steve McCurry, uh, who, who obviously shot the uh, very famous, Afghan girl for National Geographic. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. Wait. Okay, hold on. This one. Oh wow! There you go. That is couldn't this have one. worked any better. Here, <laughs> that couldn't have. We we didn't pre uh, rehearse that either. So that that was great. Yeah. That was a great little bit of. Thank uh... you. It's an original. So, I bought it in a Kenya market. So even better. So seeing as that you're, you know, you've got a, a bit of a connection with it, it right there is um, the 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 young girl who's now, of course, uh, a woman, uh, has recently seeked asylum in Italy, and that's great. But there are a few people, um, or quite a few people online, because that's the space to express yourself, that believe that in some way Steve McCurry exploited this young girl. And and some have gone as far to say that, you know, I don't know how much money um, McCurry made from this. Some people are like it was millions, but I, I have no idea. You know, I have no idea, but he'll, he'll have got paid. Um, and some people are suggesting he should give her royalties for how famous um, the, the, the girl became and the image became and his career obviously continued to be. My stance is I completely disagree with that. I I, I don't think Steve McCurry, um, I don't think he, it, to be quite blunt, I don't think he owes her anything. He was there to do a job. He did his job. And what happened from there happened. You know, it, it went back then what we would today call viral, right? It went physically viral, not virtually viral. I just wondered, you know, for someone with a journalistic background who's who's obviously, you know, photographing very important um, stories, very prominent people in society, kind of how you feel about people pushing back against photojournalists and saying, you owe your subject something. I mean, first of all, do they know how much freelance journalists make? Because we're like <laughs> the lowest paid industry that requires a college degree. <laughs> like I, I literally was making like in Kenya for many years, like maybe $14,000 a year. And I was, okay. I was like full time, you know, shooting for yeah. pretty good organizations like Al Jazeera and, and you know, was making nothing. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, there's a, like this misconception that we're like making a lot of money and we're not. Um, I also think, you know, the, the people in the peanut gallery who have like a lot of criticisms about, you know, how we like how we're documenting. And, and I should say like, I'm open to a lot of criticism about the media, but these these ideas that like we're making money we're exploiting people out of like their misery i just don't find that to be really um common in like the higher echelon kind of like organizations there is a lot of due diligence that's done to like are we going to share this this photo are we not you know um i i think that like i also i also just am like this requires a lot of sacrifice like did you go to afghanistan like, did, did you like, you know, bring like a million rolls of film to Afghanistan and basically like live outside in like really difficult situations or like, you know, like McCurry has like a career that is not easy to emulate for a reason. Like he has sacrificed a lot to, to go to these really remote places. And like, while I'm open to the criticism, I'm also like, you're an accountant who gets like a really nice, like office in like a quiet space, like where you can have peace in a personal life. Like, I just don't, you know, I, I, I try not to entertain those kinds of narratives. I also think that there's something to be said, like, I know that McCurry has 
advocated quite a bit on her behalf to get her out of Afghanistan and and to get her yeah. uh, asylum status. But I'm also like, and, and I find that with my colleagues who are dear to me, my very close colleagues, that they do actually go above and beyond to have these human experiences with people where they, you know, check in and they try to help them and advocate them in the ways that they can. But like so many other photographers, you know, that aren't in journalism, frankly, like they don't stay connected to people. And I think it's like a huge thing for McCurry to like have this ongoing connection and like check back with her over decades and decades. And my big thing is like, um, you know, there is a fine line between getting involved in somebody's like personal struggle versus, you know, being a cold, hard journalist who's like, I'm just here to document. And I don't find that there's a lot of the latter. I oftentimes tell people like, are you going to be able to sleep at night knowing the work that you did will go publicly? And are you going to be able to sleep at night um, knowing you did what you could do to represent that person? And if the answer is, yeah, you can sleep well at night, then you've done your job you, and you can live with yourself because people can criticize you about your professional life, but they don't have to live it. And they're, they're not having the terrifying dreams and like the terror, the terrible trauma that comes with these kinds of things. Okay. Um, I'm back again. So this is my fault. I'm, 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 uh, you'd think I'd, I'd get an, a better internet connection, which I usually have, but today it's, it's been a little bit temperamental, but, um, Katie, thanks for your ongoing patience. I, I do, I do appreciate it. Um, I'm actually going to go back to the, to the Steve McCurry thing, because I, I agree. I think people don't have, um, an understanding of what maybe the alternative is. Once you start attacking journalists, whether they be photo journalists, um, written journalists, vid visual journalists, you know, uh, it's going to put people off doing the job potentially. And then that alternative is a very, very bad state for society. Because if, if we don't have people going out, risking their mental health, risking their physical health, you know, often, like you say, not, not everyone, uh, you know, I'm not going to talk about Steve McCurry's finances, but I'm, I'm sure he's done all right throughout his career. But for most people, um, it often is a case of just getting by. And, you know, it, once you start putting people off doing that, um, that we're, we're not going to know what's going on in the world. And, that, and that, that's dangerous. On the flip side, um, I, I do agree that there is a need for conversation and understanding about it, it. I don't believe it can just be a free for all, like journalists can just document whatever they want and put it out there. And uh, th there's an example going on at the moment. Um, I'm terrible with names and it, you know, it's probably not, not fair to, to name the photographer as it, as it's still being investigated, but there, there was an image, um, you know, people will see it online and it, it was from Africa and it was of a small, I don't know if it was a girl or a boy, but they were three years old. Um, and printed was their name, their age, their location, their face, their body. And this, this poor child, um, was uh, a victim of, of, of rape, which is, which is terrible. And I do think there's, there needs to be a line somewhere where we say, just because it's on the other side of the world, you know, where maybe access to certain, that would never happen in, in, in a London hospital or, or in, you know, New York hospital. Hey, can I just come and point a camera in a three-year-old rape victim's face? Um, there has to be a certain degree of empathy. Um, I do, I do know what I'm referring to. I don't know if you saw this on online. So I don't know the particular image, but I've had a lot of conversations about that scenario, particularly, um, I have a colleague or two that's photographed, um, women and, and young girls who work in brothels in Bangladesh. And it's like, mm -hmm. um, at, at how much do you show? How much do you not show to get the point across? Um, for me, like, I also find, so I think there's two pronged things here, like particularly photographing Africa and people living in Africa. There's like this trope that it's okay to like photograph people in squalor because that's like appropriate in some way. Um, and I think like, you know, I, I think that there's an importance in documenting, but also having humanity for people. Like I have photographed you know, people who have really, really advanced cancers, like cancers that you have never seen anything like 
this in in the West or you know the UK or whatever, like people's faces being eaten away, and it's like very graphic. But like doing it in a way where there was like a lot of shadow on like the tumor, and like um, there's this one image that I photographed of Musa Ghali who had like a softball sized um, tumor in his eye coming out, and um, but like he's holding this like child's hand mirror that's like the shape of a heart and he's like trying to like you know brush away some of it and like still some dignity kind of like in in the image and in his life I also find it like super lazy as a photographer and I'm not speaking of anybody in particular but just generally to yeah. just take these like straightforward like portrait photos of like really gruesome things like there are ways to tell these stories um in a creative and nuanced way um, that don't involve like photographing a three-year-old's face. Yeah. Um, and and I just find it, and I can't speak to that per particular person, but like I I just find it lazy photography if that's all you can offer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I I agree, and I think I think there does need to be a some kind of common sense, really. I would say. Um, and I'll happily say I am speaking in particular reference to this case but it's not the only case i see it so often and i see a lot of kind of staged images as well um photographs where it's like where, where it will be in africa and it's like there was a, an image i saw recently there was plenty of beds but these babies were laying on the floor and i was like that that you know that that doesn't seem like that would be the case that there's a bed there and it's like oh let's just put the baby on the floor there's, there's a lot of images i see where i just think and i guess my biggest problem with it is they're often taken by people who aren't from that part of the world and you know I, there's there's a difference between journalism and capitalizing on suffering right and i'd say you um have clearly got got the right kind of the the right uh path you know you're you're going out there and you're telling stories for established publications and it, it will drive change but a lot of these photographers aren't working for a publication that they're, they're not even getting published in them you know they're just going on this off their own accord which is fine there's nothing wrong with that and then they're trying to be like how can i make this terrible situation even more sensationalized and i think in a way and i don't know if you sense this because I, I think we live in a time now where the the trust of the media, the mainstream media, couldn't be any lower, in my opinion. Um, and you obviously, you know, the New York Times is, is, is as big as it gets, you know, in, in terms of the States. And I don't think it, you know, it, we still get it in, in England and stuff, but, it, but it, it's huge, especially now everything's online. And how, how do you, how do you as someone who's kind of representing large media, how does that sit with you, knowing that maybe people don't trust you, or not you in particular, but you know the the publications themselves? No, absolutely. I mean, I think to to say so, we all start somewhere, right? Like I was at one time like a photographer who did not know what they were doing, and like went out and you know I've been corrected, I've been called out, you know, about photos like in the past, and I've learned from that, you know, like, and I think one of our major problems as humans is that like we refuse to take feedback and actually like let it like sink in and be like yeah maybe that wasn't the best portrayal of that person or like would I want to be portrayed like that or is it more so is it accurate to what actually is happening here um and then finally like am I able to sleep at night knowing that I took this image and it went it, it this direction you know um and so that's kind of like my main moral question that I ask myself every day is like am I able to sleep at night and with the choices that I've made. Um, but like, yeah, I mean, the, the, the backlash against the media, it has been so intense, particularly in the last two years, it's been terrifying. I mean, it's been really scary. People have, um, from every kind of walk of life and political spectrum have screamed at me, um, during my job. Um, and I think a lot of it also is because I'm a woman. And so people feel like they can bully me. I'm very small and petite. And so people have kind of like, just come up to me while I've been, you know, directing somebody or I've been like interviewing somebody and be like, who are you? Like, you need to get out of here, fake news. Um, wow. And to, to more, more escalating, I mean, honestly, very scary situations. We had like a, a right kind of um, group of people come up and start accosting um, the man that I was interviewing on camera who was black. And it was just like, 
and, and, and being like, how can you feature this man from Black Lives Matter? Like, you're just a disgusting news organization, like not knowing anything about me. Um, and so like, you know, I try to hear people out and I try to explain to them, okay, look, I've struggled all my life to get to the place that I'm at. Like I wasn't given this job just like right off the bat. I'm open to your criticism and, and, and I hope you're also open to hearing how rigorous I take my job and how seriously I take my job and my team. I've never, never worked with the caliber of people that I've worked with at the New York times ever, just in terms of ethics and thinking things through. Um, but like, it's been incredibly terrifying. And I think also with this idea of like conspiracy theories and like people going to like alternative news websites, what happens is they like, they have this mentality that they like, they're the insider and they like know more than you. And so people will kind of like corner me and be like, well, you know, the New York times is owned by da da da. And did you know that like da 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 and like they'll go down these wormholes and it's like, they actually think that they're smarter than everyone else in the world and they have it all figured out. And, and that leads to a lot of like, not just like circular conversations, but like really aggressive, violent dialogue about journalists in the media. And it's really scary for me. I, I can, yeah, I mean, I can, I can imagine how, how, how difficult that must be to deal with. I, now I, I do agree that we should, all of us, yourself included, we should always kind of keep mainstream media accountable. Um, but Absolutely. there's there's a right way to do it, you know, and it, it seems we're living in this terrible time of just over aggressive behavior, the way people are speaking to each other online, in person. You know, if, if we do want a more trusting, maybe transparent form of, of media, then we, we need to start listening you know, more, more than we do, than we do talking, you know, that the, the gentleman, um, I say gentleman, you probably might not agree with that description, but um, who, who kind of um, came at you for for interviewing someone from Black Lives Matter. Uh, he was from an all right group, you say, you know, I, I think we need to bring the conversation together from from the, both sides, um, you know, whether we agree with them or not. And then that's how we kind of build a more transparent, happier, positive future. It's never, it's not, it's never going to be brilliant in with the kind of work that you do. That's unfortunately, as you don't need me to tell you this, but it's the nature of the beast. You know, if you're reporting on difficult stories, it's, it's, it's never going to be fun, you know, uh, uh, overall, it's always going to be a challenge, but yeah, I think we just need to start well, yeah, speaking I, to each other. Sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say, I mean, yeah, I, I think that like, yeah, there's a lot of siloing of belief systems and siloing of like, people only read this news organization and this news organization. I will also say that I'm not about to give a racist a, a moment of my time. Like if you're going to like approach me and be like, you, you fake news, don't, don't interview this black man because he's black. Like, I'm not about to listen to you. So like, that's not the way to like approach me and have a like a civil conversation about my work and, and being a journalist. Like it's it's scary and i will also say that women are under particular like targeting and duress as journalists and there's not that many of us but i've been targeted directly because i'm a woman like at one point um there was a terrorist attack in kenya and a lot of the journalists were being criticized for their coverage of it which like i'm open to that conversation but then it got really personal and people were like sending twitter messages like i'm gonna drag you out into the park and rape you I'm going to like, you know, people were coming to, up to me in public places being like, you're, you're a journalist. Like I wasn't even involved in the coverage and people were like, I know you're a journalist. And so I like recently I've had to like make my social media private. Um, and, and I strongly believe that it's because I'm a woman as well. I, I, um, I, I completely understand why you would not entertain a conversation with someone who's been aggressive or threatening, um, and or, or overly racial, I, I, I get that, you know, uh, you know, some of the comments that you just mentioned are, are, are terrible. And but I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, and this, this isn't necessarily Katie's problem to solve. I, I just want to have kind of a, a conversation about it. How, how do we, how do we connect to those people? You know, people who say hold racist beliefs or, or, or people who, you know, on the other side, maybe label people racist when they're not necessarily listening to what they have to say. I think, you know, I think it's very nuanced, I guess. How, how, how do you think journalism, photography, whatever kind of journalism can help bring people back together? Because I, I, I really feel like we're just going further and further apart and not everyone is on the extreme right. Not everyone's on the extreme left, 
but they seem to be the ones with the loudest voices right now, at least. And I think maybe that's where some of the disconnect between society and, and media is coming from. I, I, how do we how do we start bringing people together? And I, I appreciate that's a very heavy question. And, you know, you're not a morning person, but, you know, I just I think it's a good conversation to cover. I do too. I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, stories oftentimes unite us um, and understanding each other's humanity. I've been trying to push to do more stories that have nuance in them. So, um, you know, with one of these protests, like we were sent out to just kind of like cover like, you know, the rallies and what was going on. And we found actually this story about these, this family that lived right next to a police department that where a police officer killed a black man. And it, so we actually spent like an evening with them as these protests were going on and this tear gas was outside their door. And like, they had, you know, like a five-year-old and a three-year-old and, and it was like, he, that is how you show the impact of violence in America is like through the nuance of people's stories who like aren't even involved in it, but have somehow become trapped in like these like violent spaces. Um, and so, you know, not all of us are like polarized in our belief system, but like finding these commonalities of like, it would be awful to have a three-year-old and a five-year-old like scared of looking out the window because they're scared that something's going to come through the window, you know? Yeah. Um, but I also think like, you know, my job primarily is to keep the power accountable. And so there are many journalists out there that do like more uniting, like softer stories. Like that is not m my particular goal because it is really hard to keep the power ac accountable. And I have this opportunity to be with the New York Times and to be well connected with them. And it's like, if I'm going to use my privilege to create change or to keep people accountable, then that's, then now is the time to do that. Excellent. I mean, honestly, Katie, you've, you've, you've given us uh, a great insight kind of into the realities of of being a, a multimedia journalist and you know I, I i'm sure no doubt anyone who wasn't kind of fully aware of the behind the scenes uh certainly will have a lot more understanding of 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 what you do and you know i sometimes find it condescending to say that you're really brave but it you know it there's there's a certain degree of kind of i couldn't do it you know that's that's why i go to like beach resorts and make pictures of you know people having a great time because you know i i, I just don't have the whatever the, the the right term is to to put myself in that situation especially with you know everything else that you're kind of managing in in your day-to-day -day personal life i think you know i think it, it shows the true power and the true um credit that people like yourself deserve um i'm just wondering be before we before before i i let you go and live your live your day kind of work-wise or even personal in terms of creativity kind of what what's coming up for you in the in the not too distant future yeah. So uh, one thing that I am starting some work on is I'm actually going to write a book about um, my experience covering the George Floyd protests and the subsequent kind of um, racial reckoning in the United States. So I have started working on that um, and I'm kind of taking a step back from the frontline stuff right now um, to get better and um, kind of, you know, hash through what's happened in the last two, three years of my life. Um, and I'm spending a lot of time in Mexico City, um, kind of like enjoying the beautiful like scenery and dog parks and like trying to learn <laughs> how to be happy again and how to not see the world through a funnel of tragedy, but rather be like, um, reflect to enjoy the beauty of, of this weird uh, world that we're living in right now. Are we still here? We're still here. We're still here. You're still I, in your torture chamber. Okay. Okay. I, 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 I am still in my torture chamber. That is, um, that is a, a peek into my personal life, but, uh, no, it's, <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> um, I, I just, I just, just want to, so the, the, the book just very quickly, cause I, I know that's a, a, a long process. Um, um, is it is it kind of a uh, a vision for when that will be ready? And, and is that going to be like a mix of like oh, no. photography and? Um, no, so it's it's going to be a memoir, um, kind of like 
detailing a bit of my work in Kenya, but then coming home and having this like divide weird intervention of, of working on the George Floyd stuff. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm working on the proposal right now. I'm hoping that the proposal is done in the next like three to four months, depending on, I have to go through like a lot of footage and stuff. And my PTSD is like, eh, you can take like 20 minutes of that once a day. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm hoping to get the proposal done, get that out to a publisher and then like, we'll be writing for like eight months. So like, uh, maybe a year. Well, I, I hope that'll be in some way cathartic as well, you know, and, and, and kind of help you, you process everything, process it, everything as, as best you can. Uh, I do appreciate you taking the time to have a chat with me. I will, um, we'll be putting links to, to you. I know you're private on the socials at the moment, but we're, we're, if it's all right with you, we can put links down where yeah. people can find you. I, I won't say them on the mic because people will just go through one ear and out the other. So we'll, we'll put links down in the description uh, and people can check that out and see all the the amazing but also the important work that you're doing thank you thank you yeah feel free to follow me i have a couple of accounts that are open and um yeah and i'll keep uh keep working on that stuff and i encourage everyone to get into journalism it is the most heartbreaking backbreaking bank account emptying job <laughs> in the world and it is the best job in the world so please please join us for the Vulture Club. I absolutely echo that. Thanks, Katie. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Well, thanks very much again to Katie uh, for speaking with me. I'm sure you'll agree it was an excellent episode of the Photographers Inside the Photographer's Mind. If you'd like to see more of her work, then you can find links to her socials and website in the description below. We will be back again next week, but please, guys, do remember to subscribe to the channel. Subscribe on Google, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And give us your feedback. Let us know what you think. It helps us keep creating the content, and it shows that we've got your support. We'll be back again next week. See ya.